We'll turn now in the Heidelberg Catechism to Lord's Day 38. Lord's Day 38. This is in the third part of the Catechism dealing with our life of thankfulness before God where he instructs us according to all his commandments about how we are to live in accordance with him and in love and harmony with our God and also with one another, our neighbors. Lord's Day 38 deals with the fourth commandment concerning the keeping of the Sabbath day. This is page 554 in the book of praise, so we'll read that together. Lord's Day 38, question and answer 103. What does God require in the fourth commandment? First, that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained, and that especially on the day of rest, I diligently attend the church of God to hear God's word, to use the sacraments, to call publicly upon the Lord, and to give Christian offerings for the poor. Second, that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works. Let the Lord work in me through his Holy Spirit, and so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. After the sermon, we will sing in response to the proclamation of the gospel. Psalm 116, stanzas 7, 8, 9, and 10. Thanks, Rod. Psalm 116, 7, 8, 9, and 10 after the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. How often do you have discussions with friends and loved ones about your activity and practice of the Sabbath day or the Lord's day, Sunday, the day of worship? Maybe it's common for for many of you. I know that whenever I have a conversation with someone about the Lord's Day, day of worship, about the gift of the Sunday that God has given us, at some point we seem to get into a discussion about what is allowed on Sunday. And Within this conversation, there is always this awareness that we know that we don't keep the Sabbath in precisely the same way as our brothers and sisters, the saints in the Old Testament church. For example, they observed the seventh day of the week as a holy day, a day where they set aside every bit of their work and it was focused on a day of worship. They did this on Saturday. And I would imagine that most of us use Saturdays in various ways, according to, you know, leisurely activities or checking off items on our our to-do lists, doing things around the house, (coughs) oil changes and Uh, cleaning up the house in preparation for for Sunday, things like that. We certainly don't uh, observe the seventh day, Saturday, in the same way that Jewish people do or the saints of the Old Testament do. There's something different already about this. And furthermore, uh, for those who observe the first day of the week as the Lord's Day, a special day of rest and worship, We also have among us people who are police officers and and doctors, farmers. There are certain things that we understand we ought to do that are in keeping with, uh, or at least not in uh, contradiction to the spirit of the Sabbath. We understand that things are a little bit different today than they were in the Old Testament. And we also see 
as we read in Luke chapter 6, we see in the ministry of Jesus that there is something very special and powerful in force in God's instruction concerning the Sabbath day. In the heart of the command for the Sabbath. If we think about what was in place in the Old Testament, uh, certain rules were there. Uh, for example, you, we're going to get to this in, in a number of weeks in our work through uh, the book of Exodus. After the people came out of Egypt and they were in the desert, God gave his law to them and instructed them in this life, and he gave them a number of specific rules about the Sabbath day. One of those, for example, is when God provided manna from, from heaven, when in the morning they got up from their sleep and they went out to gather their food for the day that God had provided. There was manna on the ground, and, and on, for them, Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, there was manna on the ground, and, and they would collect it for that day. And God commanded them on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, that's a kind of work that you ought not to do. And so on Friday, in preparation for the Sabbath, only on that day you will gather twice as much. Gather it not only for Friday, but also for Saturday, for the holy day, for the Sabbath. It was enforced in a certain way to teach the importance of this sign of the covenant of God that he was giving to them. Now a question that we need to understand is, especially in light of the differences between the way that the Old Testament church observed the Sabbath and the way that we as the New Testament church observe the Sabbath, a question that we need to understand is, what is the purpose of this? Is there still remaining a, 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 a purpose and a great theological teaching that is precious to us, or is it something that has fallen away, which may be the practice of many who would call themselves Christians? What is the purpose of the Sabbath day, of the command for the Sabbath? What does it teach? What does it point to? So our theme for this afternoon is that there is certainly a purpose. There is certainly a great point to this. The Lord Jesus Christ teaches us what the true purpose of the Sabbath is. Now at the outset here, I want us to take note here that if we go through Lord's Day 38, it's just one question and answer, and when we go through the commandments of, of God, the Ten Commandments, we have this section in the Catechism that is a, an exposition of all of the commandments of God. The, each commandment might be, you know, one or two lines, and then we have this broader explanation of what actually is at stake here? What is at the heart of all of this? We have in Lord's Day 38 one question and answer. And we might do well to take note that Lord's Day 38 doesn't say any of the things that we might wish it might speak about. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Many of our conversations about the Sabbath day, the Lord's day, Sunday, seem to end up on what is lawful? What are we allowed to do? What can we do? What, what are we prohibited from doing? What is this day for? When, when I was a kid, we had certain rules about what we would do on Sunday and, and what we wouldn't. For example, riding bikes. Riding bikes was something that we did on, on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, every other day of the week, but, but Sunday was special. No, we keep our bikes in the garage, and we do not ride bikes on Sunday. Changing clothes. We, we go to church with, with you know, suits and ties on or and dresses or very nice clothes if they're not suits or dresses. And, and in order to keep the spirit of the day and in order for us to throughout the day be reminded that today is a special day, 
we're not going to change our clothes on Sunday. And some of us may or not may not be in the practice of doing those things, but we understand that um, there were traditional ways of enforcing and understanding the, the special nature of the Sabbath. And especially was the rule that you do not work on Sunday. If, if as much as it was within your power, you pursue a career that didn't require you to work on Sunday. So what do we take from, from all of this? How do we make sense of this command that we still hear every Sunday morning? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Well, we ought to keep in mind two wonderful purposes that God has revealed in the keeping of his command here. Number one, the first purpose that we see, we'll get to the second one in a minute, but the very first purpose or reason that God has given us this uh, command is what we find in Exodus chapter 20. We read from Exodus chapter 20 uh, when we hear the law of God quite often. Other times we, we hear from Deuteronomy 5. What do we have as the reason for the Sabbath day in Exodus chapter 20? Well, we have as the reason for this is keep the Sabbath day. Why? Because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, and on the seventh day he rested. That's Exodus chapter 20. Several chapters later, Exodus 31, verse 17, we read that God gave this command because in six days he worked. He did his labor creating the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested and he was refreshed. Exodus 31, 12 through 17. I'll read this portion here. The Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign, so not only the seventh day of the week, but also certain days of the year that were designated as holy days, Sabbath days, days where you don't, do not do any work. And this is a day that is devoted to worship, a, a life with God and with one another. Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout their generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. The Lord sanctified that day. He made it holy. He's also sanctifying his people, making them, making us holy, dedicated to him. Verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbaths because it is, a, because it is holy for you. Now listen to this. Everyone who profanes it must be put to death. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Everyone who profanes the Sabbath must be put to death. Can you imagine that there were those among the people of God who broke the Sabbath day and paid that incredible price for it? Capital punishment, the same kind of punishment that there would be for murderers and rapists, the worst kinds of blasphemers, someone who profanes the holy day of God, the Sabbath, would be put to death. Verse 17, it is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. This is serious, isn't it? In Exodus, we have this pattern that God has revealed to us about how our lives ought to be conducted. Six days of work and a day of rest and refreshment. And the reason that he gives this is that this is what he, the Lord God, 
has done in his work of creating the world. Exodus, teach, Exodus 20 teaches that the pattern that God adopted, and right, he didn't need to do this as God. Does God have a, a need for refreshment or uh, a recharge of his, of his energy, of his batteries? Of course not. God is the Lord. He is infinite in power and might, and he could do strenuous work for hundreds of thousands and millions of days in succession without any need for rest or refreshment. But why did God do this? This was appropriate because of his creative work and the beauty of the work that he was doing and the necessity of, of acknowledging his glory and and for the worship of God. God worked and then stopped. Why? To take pleasure in his work. To enjoy the fruit of his labors, the work of his hands. God worked, created for six days, and he, he observed it and acknowledged it and said, this is very good. Let us enjoy this. Let us be pleased that creation is good. Right, and this is something that we can understand as human beings who are created in the image of God, taking pleasure in the work of your hands, not in, a, in, an, in an earthbound and sort of hedonistic way, but, but acknowledging the, the gift of, of energy and the gift of resourcefulness that God has given us. We can take pleasure in the work of our hands. Think of a, a week-long project that you might undertake, right? Think of the season that we are in right now, the, the beginning of spring. Spring is here and things are starting to grow. Maybe in the last while you've been busy in the yard, dethatching the lawn, prepping your garden beds, planting seeds, planting some annuals, and now you're starting to see the, the fruits of your labor the grass is turning green. It looks fertile. The grass is, is growing and getting thick. Shoots are, are, are coming out of the, the rich soil in your yard. And what do you do? You stand back and look at it. Yes, this is wonderful. You take pleasure in the work of your hands. And there's nothing ungodly about this. This is giving glory to God. He has given you the ability to, to be resourceful and to be busy in this life that you've given to him, and you can do this with all thankfulness and giving praise and thanks to him. This is a beautiful thing that we're able to do. Kids, maybe in the course of your schoolwork, from time to time you have a huge assignment that is, that is due some time from now. You, you spend a week or two on this assignment. You've been working on it for days and days. Maybe you younger kids have you know, an art project that you're working on. You spend days cutting out paper and gluing it together. You're fashioning this crafty thing. And you bring it to school to be finally graded. Older kids, you're, you're past that. You're not gluing construction paper together. You're writing research papers. You've read books. You've read articles. And you've written, you know, 10 pages on some subject. And you've done all the uh, corrections and spell checking and checked your, your work. You formatted it properly. You finally hand it in. You're going to get a grade and all this other kinds of feedback. You get a wonderful grade on it. And yes, wonderful. You take great pleasure in the works of your hands. This is good. This is the model that is given us in Exodus chapter 20. In six days the Lord made heaven and earth. On the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. What was God doing on that seventh day? He was glorying in the work of his hands. This is my creation. I am God. This is what I have done.
and this very gracious bonus that is attached to all of this is God doesn't just glory in this by himself alone. He brings us along with him. He brings us with him to enjoy the beauty of his creation and to en enjoy the work of his hands and to praise him for it. That's life. That's what we were designed for. Enjoying God, enjoying God within the framework of his wonderful creation. Why does Exodus 31 speak so strongly about this? Why is the is capital punishment attached to whether or not this Sabbath day is kept? Well, because this is the essence of worship. This is the essence of our relationship with God itself. Life, this is our life with God. Participate with God in this. Live with God in this. God gave the law here as a framework for our life that we ought to be living with him. Whether the command, the law is given or not, this is the pattern of our life. He was stressing the importance of this pattern of life through the giving of the law. To fail to do this Glorying in the creation of God, loving what he has done, worshiping God for his power and might displayed in creation. To fail to do this was to ignore that beautiful expression and opportunity of worship that is basic to our existence. So that's the purpose that's given in Exodus chapter 20. In six days God made Heaven and earth and everything that is in it, and he rested. This is a day of worship. Look what God has done. Look what God has made. Let's enjoy God in his creation together. That's the purpose given in Exodus 20. Another reason is given in Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5. Remember the Sabbath day. Why? Remember. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, therefore. That's why. You were slaves. You were in bondage. You were in oppression, this affliction that we've been hearing about so much in the past number of weeks. That was your life. God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and that's why you have the Sabbath now. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. We heard this morning about the reason that was going to be issued to Pharaoh himself about why it was such a horrific thing that he was doing, enslaving the people of God. Israel is my firstborn son. This is the reason that, Pharaoh, you should release them. Why? Because while you are enslaving them, they cannot enjoy the life with God that they're supposed to have. Pharaoh must release them from slavery so that they can rejoice in their freedom and be restored. Be restored to their ability to live according to that original creation pattern. Worship the Lord. Live with him. Love him. Enjoy him. While they're in Egypt, they cannot do that. Pharaoh is preventing that. So now here in Deuteronomy, with Exodus and Deuteronomy, there, there are two layers to this command. Why is the Sabbath day so important? The original layer of worshiping God because of who he is as creator, that remains. We are his creatures. He is our God. He is our creator. Let's live together, enjoy him, worship him. That remains. But now there's this additional layer of salvation and restoration. They were enslaved. They were completely prevented from enjoying the Lord. From living life with God. They were separated from Him in a certain sense. 
Now God has saved them. He has given them new life. He's given them a new land, a new home. And he has restored their ability to be with him. What a beautiful thing he has done there. God was, in a way, planting a new garden for them to live in, restoring that life of paradise, a life of holy, loving communion with God. You were slaves, you were prevented from this, and I have freed you now. Observe the Sabbath with all that in mind. That is a sign of all that I have done and all that I am for you. I am the Lord. Enjoy me. Enjoy a life with me. All of that is is bound up in this command for the Old Testament church. In the command to keep the Sabbath day. So now we come to the New Testament. and, And then our setting as the church. We still hear this law every week. From time to time we hear either the Exodus 20, reason for the command, or the Deuteronomy 5, reason for the command. How do we observe the command to keep the Sabbath day holy? Observe it. Enjoy it. Well, we've heard in the past number of weeks in our treatment of Exodus how the deliverance out of slavery and into this new life, deliverance from Egypt is supposed to be for us in our minds a pattern of the salvation that we we receive through Jesus Christ. Yes, exactly. The pattern is in place here also with the fourth commandment. Same thing. Because of their slavery, right, God's people were prevented from living out their purpose that God had created them with. Living with God, enjoying Him and His creation, taking pleasure in the work of God's hands. In short, they were stripped, robbed of a life of worship and communion with the Lord God. So what is Jesus teaching then in these two instances in Luke chapter 6? He's teaching the exact same thing. The exact same thing. What is the Sabbath for? It is for our life with God. The Jewish rulers, lawyers, legalists, scribes, Pharisees, many different names for those who used the law of God in a certain way. Let's call them lawyers. They had all these rules about how to externally keep the Sabbath. Be careful, only take this many steps every day. You know, you need to do a couple, you know, a certain number of steps to get up in the morning and eat and perform all of your necessities and and go to the temple or whatever. So this many steps you may take, but do not do one more. If you do one more, you're working. You've broken the Sabbath. Do not make a spark to start a fire, you know, and cook your food. Eat cold food on the Sabbath. Today there are Jewish laws about Shabbat, laws that have taken shape over the years that dictate things like, for example, whether on the Sabbath you could use a light switch like what we have here, we have light switches all over the place. Are you legally allowed to walk over to that wall and flick that switch and turn the light on or not? No, you may not do that. You've initiated a spark, you know, electricity, and you've in a way started a fire, which is against the Torah, and you have performed work. You may not do that. So, Let's invent a switch that you can do, where you can turn lights on, that according to our understanding of the law, we're not starting a fire, we're not igniting a spark, and we can have lights on and off on on Shabbat. Those are the details and the lengths of the legalism of, of, of all of this. 
How do we define work? Right? Don't do this. Don't do that. As long as we keep it within these rules as we understand them, follow the rules and, and we're okay with the Sabbath. What's missing here? What's missing here with this? What's missing is the heart of the Sabbath, the, the purpose of it. It's not about rules and regulations, about if you take 40 steps or 41, that's the difference between keeping the Sabbath and not. What's the heart here? In Luke 6, Jesus' disciples, well, and then Jesus himself, they were condemned by the lawyers, the ones who knew the law. Whoa, whoa, whoa you broke it. Says here you broke it. They were condemned for picking some grain on the Sabbath, you know, rubbing it in their hands to, to break the chaff away from the grain so they could eat it. They picked some grain on the Sabbath to eat, to nourish themselves. According to the details of the law, that is defined as work. You are condemned. Don't do that. What were they doing? What were they doing? Jesus and his men were were ministering to the people. They needed to eat a little bit to be sustained in the course of this day. They were serving the great purpose of the Sabbath, to bring God's people into a state of worship and praise and enjoyment of God, communion with God. That's why Jesus uses that example of David and the showbread. Yes, according to the letter of the law, which was given as a rule, as a tutor, for understanding the purpose of the Sabbath, that rule was there. David wasn't supposed to eat that showbread. His men were not legally entitled to eat the showbread. But because there was something greater at work there, they were allowed to do it. It's the same with this healing miracle that comes immediately after in Luke chapter 6. The lawyers were watching him, we read in verse 7 there. The scribes and Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. Says here in our rule book, if you do this and that, then you are guilty of breaking the law. You are guilty. He broke it, according to them. But then he challenges them with the question about the purpose of the Sabbath. What is it for? What sorts of things are appropriate for the Sabbath day? What sorts of things are, are most in keeping with the spirit of the Sabbath, with the spirit of the day of worship? Verse 9, Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath? So pick one. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to either do good or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? This man, in Luke 6, much like the, the woman in the Gospels who was bent over, she was crippled, she was bound, she was chained for many long years. On the Sabbath day, the Lord Jesus Christ healed her from that, released her from that crippling oppression on the Sabbath day. Jesus said, which one of you would not untie one of your animals to let them go and eat or drink on the Sabbath day? Of course you would. How much more is it appropriate that this woman who has been bound by this crippling affliction for this many years release her from this on the Sabbath day? It's not only lawful on the Sabbath day, the Sabbath day is the best day for it. Of all the days possible, the Sabbath day is the most appropriate day for this to happen. On the Sabbath, these two experienced a miraculous restoration. This is the day of salvation. This is the day of healing. This is the day to glory in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why we worship on this day. This is why we're instructed to devote ourselves to ensuring that we can all enjoy 
a holy and joyful kind of activity on this day. This is the day that the Lord Jesus Christ broke the bonds of death. He rose from the dead. It was proclaimed in magnificent ways, this miraculous resurrection of the dead, that our sins were paid for. Our sins were covered over. Sin was defeated. We are no longer in bondage to sin. We have been liberated. Death has been defeated. This is the day that it was proclaimed that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ. So then what is appropriate for this day? Well, what do we read in Lord's Day 38? What do we read in Lord's Day 38 as instruction for how to keep the Sabbath? Number one, that the ministry of the gospel in the schools be maintained. Providing for the preaching of the word. What is in keeping with the spirit of the Sabbath day? A proclamation of rest. A proclamation of restoration and new life. We provide for the preaching of the word, supporting pastors, supporting missionaries in their work, providing for the training of those who would bring the gospel. When it says that the ministry of the gospel and the schools be maintained, we understand that the schools specifically are theological schools, the training of the bringers of the gospel. As Canadian Reformed Churches, we have as part of our responsibility the support of our own seminary, CRTS. What a beautiful gift God has given us in this. It's a very costly endeavor. It's our responsibility as members of the church to make sure that, for example, our seminary, CRTS, is able to run that the professors have the ability to focus on their work and be provided for so they can provide for their wives and their children. They can have what they need to do their work. And that students, students who are studying there have what they need to do their work in preparation for the ministry of the gospel. Our contributions here that we give to for, for the budget of providence, they go toward these beautiful acts of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The ministry of the gospel in the schools, we must maintain them. Especially in the day of rest, I diligently attend the church of God to hear God's word, to use the sacraments, to call publicly upon the Lord, and to give Christian offerings for the poor. This weekly worship that we enjoy here together as the church is such a central part of our life as the body of Christ. Here in worship together, this is where the gospel of salvation and restoration, healing is proclaimed and heard. This is where you hear and, and, and lay hold of the promises of your salvation, your liberation from sin, and the promise of life in Jesus Christ forever and ever. Here is where we enjoy God and His creation in the highest degree together with the saints that we are united with. So to neglect to come and worship with the people of God is to devote the day to something or someone else. It's to neglect to worship the Lord and to serve one another. Christ has come. Christ has done his work so that you can have a day like today. Called to worship the Lord as you were designed for. And here your offerings that you give in support of the work of the deacons, these are such a beautiful expression of the love of God 
God's compassion and love and mercy are, are shown in the way that he cares for the poor, the needy, the downtrodden. Here is where we especially and, and visibly support the work of the deacons. Here is where we make God's love shine so brightly out of our congregation. Finally, that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works and let the Lord work in me through his Holy Spirit and so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. Here in worship, here is where the Lord especially works our faith. He gives the gift of faith. He strengthens our faith, our trust in him. And here is where he equips us for the life that we are supposed to live. The life that we live today is meant to be a beginning of the life that we expect and hope to live for eternity. The life that you live throughout this week is meant to be a foretaste of the life that we will live together in the new heavens and the new earth. Whatever is appropriate for that life, think about that. You imagine what that life might be like. Pure joy and bliss in the presence of God, surrounded by the company of saints. What is that life going to be like? Well, as much as possible, that life is supposed to have a beginning here. Our life here should be a, a glimpse, a preview, a sneak preview of that life. So whatever is appropriate for our life in the coming glory, let's fill the Lord's day with that. Let's live together on this day. Be together in each other's homes. Let's worship together diligently as God's people and look forward to the fuller gift of the Sabbath rest that is coming. So may this day, Sunday, the Christian Sabbath, may this day help us in this. This day is for our benefit. May it help us in this. May it help us enjoy the Lord fully in the beginning of our eternal life. Amen.